Hi, Jay. Hey, Tim. How's it going? Good. Welcome to Howl Insights. Appreciate your time today. Sure. Thank you. Um, I think we're, we're going to talk a little bit about um, engineering and AI, but I'd like to start with a little bit of your background and give people context on uh, right. what, how you got here. Yeah. Um, so I started uh, actually in the Air Force working on computers, and uh, that got me money for college, so I got an engineering degree and uh, went into um, aircraft electronics at a giant company and learned a lot. Uh, those big companies are really good for teaching new engineers the right way to do things. Uh, a good example is um, one of our customers was Boeing and a uh, cranky old engineer uh, wouldn't let me get away with anything. Taught me all about how to uh, how to make sure any change you make will definitely be safe. Reputations, everything. Um, and then he retired. <laughs> so I don't know who's doing that now. But um, I was lucky to. You know, it was very difficult. It's hard to get any him to approve anything, and that was really good training. Um, and then, you know, I took that up myself when I'm dealing with suppliers. Uh, and then um, went to uh, medical devices for uh, manufacturing uh, implantable defibrillators and learn more about, um, I guess, manufacturing in general. That when you're doing something uh, at those high volumes, it, uh, a small mistake gets amplified and it, it justifies doing extra work to fix it. So it, um, it really makes it clear why, why volume is important. That if you can do a lot of something quickly, it will, you'll just learn that much faster. Um, and then I went to a startup, a uh, solar power startup, and that was, I was the 30th person hired and um, we had a very aggressive plan. I didn't think uh, engineering project, it was all hardware and software, and uh, putting units in the field, utility scale units, um, and they did it. It, it went, we hit every uh, financial target, technical target, and schedule target, and I, I was blown away. Um, and then they shut down, because uh, solar panels are getting cheaper exponentially. They're basically following Moore's law because a solar chip is a, a kind of microchip. Um, and so even though it was a great idea and we did everything successfully, um, it, you just can't compete with that. So uh, it was, you know, as an investor, it was wise, wise to shut down. But I really loved the excitement, like working in that, that small group. Um, 30 people to maybe 300. I think it got to 300 by the end, and that, that was perfect. And then I got into space engineering and uh, worked on maybe a dozen spacecraft. Uh, and, and then COVID hit, and I'm full-time remote, uh, so I decided to consult some on the side, and that went well, so I consulted to my former employer uh, to help wrap things up, and um, I've been doing that ever since. That's great. So um, the consulting you're doing now, I think, is in AI. Yes, I'm. Uh, yeah, so I see AI as a tool. So just like um, PowerPoint or uh, anything like making a website. Um, there was a time we had overhead slides and then some teachers started using PowerPoint and they kept fonts and add images and so the, the quality of um, presentations went up dramatically and the amount of effort it took to make them went down. Uh, so I kind of see AI as a tool like that and right now we're in a we're in that transition phase where people aren't sure what to do with it and there's many offerings and some are better than others and so I uh, I'm teaching startups uh, how to like adopt it 
Do you see any similarities in the lessons you've learned in engineering with um, a lot of the the aerospace and some of the medical device? You have, like you said, you had to make sure that there were no mistakes. And have do you does any of those do any of those engineering learnings lend themselves to the way you perceive AI tools today? Yes. <laughs> um, wow, that's such a good question. I so so one challenge all these industries so like aircraft and medical devices um, spacecraft because it's so hard and expensive you you're using real people thank you making making their best judgment calls on what to do and uh, I found and actually I, I I'm recalling a statistic I don't know where I saw it but something about something like uh, experts are right about 80% of the time. And and so accepting that, if you're making a something like a medical device, you have a team of software people and hardware people and people that specialize in high voltage electronics and low voltage electronics and control systems and in the manufacturing people, if everybody's 80% right, then by the time you get to the end, you're guaranteed to have problems. And so you have to have like a, an approach that accepts wrong answers will be there. And so this is kind of how I deal with AI, that everything it says might be wrong. And if you code with AI, uh, it might, it, you know, the worst thing is it'll look okay, but it isn't. So you want to do, you want to cross check things and think about, well, how do I know this is right? And so let's say I use AI to make a marketing campaign and it's helping with my images. How do I know these images are good? And so, you know, thinking about what is the difference between a good result and a bad result um, is probably what, I, what I'm getting into my approach to AI. Yeah, I mean, so much of it is you can't abdicate responsibility to AI, but it's an incredible tool to leverage. You know, Absolutely. it's like an electric drill versus a... Uh, traditional drill. Yeah, you still have to hold the drill, right. but you'd much you'll be done a lot sooner with electric drill. That's really good. Yeah, and it and you know I learned early on using a Dremel that uh, I could really screw things up quickly, <laughs> very quickly. <laughs> so I could never screw this up by hand. <laughs> yeah, so that's a good good example. Yeah, that's a really good point. So the speed is part of the problem. Good. Um, and then when you trust it too much and you forget that uh, it's only 80%, then you're going you're gonna to have issues. Yeah, those, those, um, the probability of errors, uh, they multiply and it's not very forgiving. Yeah. You've been working with coaching and consulting uh, with founders and entrepreneurs on AI. What, what are maybe the top three lessons uh, that... that You've, you've come away with from the experience of teaching people how to use AI? Yeah, I would say top three. Uh, number one, I think a lot of people are daunted at first. And, and the approach, like if you want to take an AI class and you Google AI classes, you'll get a, the bulk of them will be trying to teach you how learning large language models work. And it's just overwhelming for people. And, and, you know, we have the movies with the Terminator, and, and so it's scary. They're scared of it. And then when they actually use it, it's like, oh, this is um, fun. It's not just not daunting. It's it's a fun thing to do. and uh, Not daunting, but empowering. Empowering. It's Yeah, and, and not just empowering, but I guess it's like going back to the PowerPoints. Like now making slides is kind of a little art project. Right. And before you had overhead slides you're writing on it, you know, was tedious. Yeah, so that's one. Another one is a lot of people have um, uh, obligations to their customers that they can't trust the AI with. And um, a good example is like HIPAA. So I have one client who um, has sensitive patient data that she doesn't want to put it online and give OpenAI access to it, and it's not clear if that's even legal 
even if they say it's legal, they don't specify it. They don't say, oh, and HIPAA's fine. Um, it, and so um, that I'm noticing, like NDAs, I have NDAs, and you know I don't feel comfortable putting my client's data on these um, online um, AI. And so a workaround with them starting to work on is setting up a computer where you keep all the AI on your side. And is that just open source, or is that also air gap? That uh, there's a thing called a digital diode um, that makes it impossible for data to be sent off your computer without you knowing it. Okay. And I have not set that up yet, but I have a, a friend in uh, Colorado that has done those. And um, so that's kind of my next next problem to solve is, um, is making that. So that's a, a concern. So you just have to be aware when you're using it um, that, that you, you still want to protect whoever you need to protect and your, your duty to them. Uh, like the, like the usefulness of the AI shouldn't supersede that. So just something to be aware of. Um, yeah, and I guess that, that, that kind of segues into the third one is the whole issue of um, ownership, like copyright. If the AI makes an image for me, can I use it? And have you gotten a sense of if you engineered that that you own it? Yes, and I think, and I've you know I've seen off and on different takes, but I think that um, even if you don't touch it, you just immediately post it on your website. The it's your copyright. You posted it, so the way you made it, and a, a person explained to me how they took it. If you go on um, Upwork and you hire an artist and you say, make me, you know, a castle with flying ducks or whatever, and they make you a digital image of a castle with flying ducks, and you post it on your website. That's your image. Like, it, it doesn't matter that you hired a person to yeah, do it. Yeah, the prompt engineer was done whether it was a, a person doing the work or exactly. a program. Exactly. So you're, it's still your work. Um, and there's some, uh, there's a gray zone, I, th I think, with uh, living artists. So, and, and a non-gray zone. So a non-gray zone is like Disney. If you put uh, Darth Vader on your website, that's a Disney product, and it doesn't matter that AI made it for you. It's still... Uh, clearly copyright. Clearly, you're clearly violating copyright. And I think that should apply to living artists styles. So that person spent years developing that style and the fact that you can type the style in the prompt and get a work similar to what they would make, it, it's a little bit of a gray leaf. Kind of like right IP, now. they're still monetizing that. Yeah, they're still monetizing it, but if you do it in the style of a uh, um, uh, Vinci or somebody Vinci, else. Vinci, yeah, then they're that it's gone out of copyright. Uh, Who's going to complain? Ever made. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I, I think that that's a like a gray zone. Right. That there's a gray zone in the living artist is gray because it's a style. So it's not a character like Darth Vader that's right. protected. Um, yeah, I I think and you know every country every state has different rules and things change with time. So. I, I kind of, um, I think that, that these gray zones, it, it reminds me of, um, like, uh, you know, is it legal for Uber to ride share when they don't have a taxi medallion? And and so... It's so a classic first, case of disruption against legislation. Yeah. And when you first start doing it, you might be committing a crime. Like, you don't know, and Uber doesn't know. And right. some people might say yes, some would say no, and... Um, I still use Uber, so <laughs> it's not. It seemed fair to me. What What turned you on to the idea of, you know, doing the advising consulting for yeah. for AI and and what was your original thesis? Like, you know, the, who was your target audience when you first right. started? I when I first started. Um, I guess it's the same. So my target audience are, are small, hard tech startups. Okay. 
end. Um, I like that, uh, you know, the capital intensive, it's going to take a few years before you even know you're going to, it's going to work. You have zero revenue and you need a lot of people doing a lot of hard things and they all have to work together. Uh, and the bigger companies that have thousands of people, um, they're almost like government departments. So they, um, the way they beha behave and act and uh, it's just not as, they're not as um, open to new ideas. And so the small startups are, are way more open to new ideas. They're taking risks constantly as, and so they're more comfortable with risk. Um, so with AI, it, my thesis is if you can get somebody um, like with the, the co-pilot um, programming, so here's a stat, I think, uh, if, I, if I'm remembering correctly, an expert coder working with AI is about 20% more efficient or faster, and a new coder is like 400% faster because they get that much more out of it. And if you can get the similar results with the other AI for the other departments, then a startup where everybody's wearing six hats, you know, when I'm wearing the one hat they hired me for, I might be an expert, but when I'm wearing the other five hats, I might be more like a new person. So if AI can get everybody acting that much better, then a hundred person company should be able to act more like a thousand person company, but without the administrative bureaucracies, because everybody knows everybody. So that's, that's a thesis. Great, and um, how is that borne out? Like, are, are, are you finding people are receptive to this guidance, or are you finding surprises in which, which kind of pieces of the guidance are most well-received? Yeah, it's, I'm getting that there's some people that, that, I don't, that got it, I guess. Um, and I was like that. This time last year, the light bulb went on. And a few months before, people were talking about AI, and I had looked at it, and I said, this is just going to cause more headaches than it's worth. And then six months later, I looked at it again, and I'm like, oh, it's gotten so much better. Now, in spite of the headaches, it's useful. And here we are a year later. Now it's actually... It's getting to be pretty powerful. It's powerful. It's, it's definitely... That you definitely should look at. So I find that there's some people that get that just like I already did and, and are super engaged and some people are like opposed to it. Some think it's unethical to use it. It's like cheating on tests or something. And uh, and yeah, so and then you know, some are more curious, there's a lot of caution. And it's you know, there should be some caution, so that's that's reasonable. What are some of your favorite tools that you're experiencing right now? I think um, I recently talked to a friend of mine, uh, Kevin Williams, and he introduced me to the ability for uh, Claude, because it was using Java, to actually run the code mm. in, a, in what they call an abstract, really? which is what the code window is yeah. referred to on their platform. And it really, it, you know, t you can go completely from, a, as a, a non-coder myself, you know, a, a prompt to a working app or an applet. Nice. Um, what are some of the things that have you've been most impressed with? You know, I know it's a rapidly evolving place that, that you bring to folks' attention that you like using yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I, because uh, as soon as you asked, I, I pulled up Perplexity on my okay. phone. <laughs> have you used Perplexity? A little bit. I I've got a window with each of them open. Oh, so, good. So that way I just kind of drop between them when I want to do a what if or c compare and contrast. Yeah, very nice. I um, I was doing that. Uh, I had a handful of AI for different tasks, and Perplexity was one of four. And now I just use Perplexity. And it's, I found it, it's like layers of AI that search for things online. And it's so much better than Google. 
Um, so I was uh, I was doing a trail run a month ago, and uh, my meniscus tore, and uh, that hurt a lot. So, but I had self signals, so I asked perplexity. I described the symptoms, and it said, well, it's probably one of these three things. And I said, um, well, how likely is it for each? And two of them were very likely, and one was very unlikely. And I said, well, what is a treatment? And it told me how to treat those two things. It's an identical treatment, so that's easy. And there is one way that you can tell apart which injury it is. And so you're not supposed to go to the doctor for like 48 hours because that's how long it takes to get the data back on whether it's one type or the other type. Um, and so by the time I get to my car, I'm you know limping for a mile. I've got a plan for what I'm going to do as soon as I get home. I don't need to stop at Walgreens and get anything. And uh, I know what kind of doctor to call. And then two days later, I go to the doctor and they do real diagnosis, and it's exactly what perplexity said. Right. And, and it's just a little discussion while walking. And when you're using Google for that, you're getting advertisements for local doctors or videos about, you know, special gear that costs hundreds of dollars. Like it's costs. data overload and not a lot of relevant input. And it, it's not just overload of data, it's overload of sales data. So Google is, uh, has now had decades of people matri ma mastering SEO and paid advertising. And so that's most of what you get. And with the perplexity, I just get an answer with some references that I can click on, and when I go there, they're actually useful. Sometimes it's confused, so it's about 80% of the time it's good. But I use that, it's on my phone and my desktop, and I use it instead of Google. That's incredible. Uh, any other tools that come to mind? I mean, I, yeah, so I, I have a class where I teach a dozen. Okay. Um, and and how to use them, how to use outputs of some to be inputs to others, and, and so I so think it's like it is, rolling your own agents. Yeah, a little bit. Yep. And uh, and my approach, you know, I kind of think of them as interns. So it's like each one is an intern with like six PhDs who's never had a real job. And so you're you're asking them to help. Um, and so that's how I teach it. I'm trying to think of... I mean, perplexity is really good. Um, I just started one, uh, the co-pilot on my phone, where you can put voice inputs, and it will give you a voice output. Okay. And that's fantastic if I have a quick question while I'm driving, it's because I can't type and look at things. And so I'll... Um, ask it a question and get an answer, and that that's pretty handy. It's not as I don't think it's as good as perplexity, but it's kind of similar. Sure. Well, the user operability is a big deal as well. Yeah. What is um, what are the types of things that you're encouraging folks to consider as use cases? Because I think what's happened over the past couple of years, the functionality of the systems have gotten much better. Yeah. But um, the things you could do, like, you know, we couldn't effectively without high latency done audio to audio previously. Mm -hmm. um, and then people are layered in tools with the, the, the multimodality. It's now getting pretty good. And then the API integration with being able to drop in uh, content. Yeah, yeah, it's better. Uh, is there Are there any specific <laughs> ways that you're encouraging people to, do, you know, kind of phase one of playing with AI and making it their, their friend? Yeah. The, um, so, yeah, there's a perplexity for search. Um, and then for images, the um, there's a, a handful of images, image AIs. I really like Dream Studio. Um, a handy one is uh, the uh, Stability AI has a search engine for prompts other people have done. 
And it's a really nice head start because coming up with prompts or images is almost an art by itself. And I believe it always will be because artists have a certain way of seeing things. They went to art school so they know what the terms are for things. And if you're just a random person with no art background, you're, the way you describe it, even if the AI artist is smart, it still isn't as precise as an artist can describe it. And so it will get, the artist will get closer. Um, so a nice thing about Dream Studio, it's really easy to get into. And a friend of mine um, had a kid's birthday party, like 30 kids. And he made a custom image for each kid based on what they like. And so the little bag of party favors for every kid was customized to that kid. And just, you know, playing with AI art, it's such an easy way to, to do something. And it really, you know, it's, there's so many places you can add images and marketing and websites and presentations that just make it more interesting. So it doesn't have to be um, precise or exactly what what you're trying to do it just has to fit the role yeah really speeding up that content generation yeah uh you were telling me um over lunch that you recently did a presentation at the small set conference you want to yeah. tell us a little bit about that yeah so i um I'm, uh my presentation is on why commercial and automotive industry quality is now so much higher than space quality. And it's due to Wright's Law, which is uh, a, the... So Moore's Law for computers is a subversion of Wright's Law. And it just says that the more volume you have, the better you get. So we've got more iPhones in a day than all of the space industry since Sputnik. So the volumes are insane for commercial, and they learn so fast, and a tiny mistake is worth millions of dollars when you have that high volume. And with space, a tiny mistake isn't discovered because the satellite stops working, or your Starliner stops working, and they may not know why. Um, well, Starliner, they'll figure out because it'll, well, they might not. Yeah, <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, that's that one's too recent. But yeah, when a satellite fails, you don't. Nobody's going up to figure out exactly what's wrong with it. So whereas with the cars and and cell phones, if something fails, they can figure out is this a major issue or an outlier. Um, so that was what my paper is about: was to get the space industry to look at what the other industries are doing for inspiration and buy it directly from them and not not stick so much with the this techno the technology they've developed that's not kind of falling behind. Right. Yeah. Um what who are you looking to work with now on your your consulting business? Um yeah I really like uh Hard tech, so um, renewable And what do you energy. mean by hard tech? Yeah, it's some people call it hard tech, some call it deep tech, and it's anytime you have like a cell phone, it's got physical, it's got batteries and a controller, but the software is important, and so this is hard. It's not, um, whereas not hard tech is like software. It may be hard, but it's, it's just software. And you can buy an iPhone and make an app for it. So the hard aspect is done. And what makes it hard for investors is you can go from an idea to something like Facebook. I think that took six months. And you have a billion dollar company in six months. Like that is amazing. And with something like an iPhone, even a powerful computer company like Apple took years to develop um, and get... Like the glass, the Gorilla Glass was uh, a major innovation. Nobody had that kind of touchscreen before that was also capable of some abuse and not shatter. And so it, it took them years to get that and getting everything else working. And then it has to fit this little package. And so that took some innovation. Um, and when you go years without revenue, it 
the investors don't know if it's working or not. Like you don't have any feedback, so you just have to depend on your milestones. Are you hitting the milestones? And even if things aren't working, are some of the things working? And are any of these milestones a deal breaker? So I I really enjoy that um, that kind of environment, and I I think it's um, uh, a moat because it's hard. So the investors that do have the stomach for it. Um, when it does work, they're now like NVIDIA. So they've got a huge head start on everybody. And how do people reach out to you if they want to work together? So uh, if, Jay, if people want to reach out to you, uh, what's your website? It is www.marginalx.com slash Ideal Frontiers. Great. So I'll, I'll one word. And Ideal Frontiers is um, what I'm focusing on for um, you know making my offerings more user friendly. Great. And are there any additional thoughts you have on things that you know early stage founders that are wrestling with, um, you know, for raising the money, you know, trying to make that initial bit of traction? Any any yeah. advice? I know, raising money. Um, yeah, they're so optimistic. <laughs> I. It's interesting. I. I think. I think finding that sweet spot in the speed, that if you, if you tell investors, it might take twelve iterations to succeed, then nobody will. Fund that because it's too. Daunting. Um, but if you tell them you'll get it right on the first try, that doesn't seem very honest. So something there, there, there needs to be some balance there that, that you have room for the first one not to work. You know, SpaceX, the the fourth rocket was the one that worked. So they and, had, and would have been the last if it hadn't. And it would have yeah, that was as much as they could afford. And if they had only planned to do two, it never would have made it. So that, uh, so there, there, I think that's a thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what the advice is, is to, because I, I see people fail on their first try and then they can't get money because it's like they they tried and failed. And engineering is, if you're doing something hard, it's hard. And so the first one almost never works. And you learn a lot, and then the second one's better. So um, it it has to be kind of built into the plan that that you're thinking that way in terms of iterations. Yeah, managing expectations and setting them as well. And and setting them and being, um, you know, you like it to work on the first try, so you have to be serious. But um, yeah, yeah, if you run out of money on the first try, then what? Great. Well, thank you so much for your time. I sure, greatly appreciate you. it. And uh, I'll put some notes in the, sh in the show notes for folks to reach out. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.